Hello, my name is Aisha and today my topic is going to be on the significance of sex in the Islamic community or the Islamic circle. I'll be following this content in order to present my discussion to you. So in the Islamic faith or the Islamic religion, the stance of sex is heterogeneous and it is within the legal marriage between a man and a woman who are married. Sexuality is identified and it is acknowledged, but a Muslim must act on the preordained rules and regulations that God has for him or her. Example of being, being attracted to a person of the same gender or first a blood relation, which is also frowned upon. So my thesis for this project is in Islam, legal sex is seen as essential for the growth of human populations. And my guiding question here is how does the Islamic faith describe sex for human lifestyle? According to the um, teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran, he said that a man has to, he has that obligation to make sure that his wife is satisfied before he himself is satisfied. And a man making sure that his wife is satisfied is considered as a charity, like a holy merit, in that he is acting upon what God has ordained for him. There are some individuals, even in the prophetic eras, who will abstain from sex and do all other major good deeds, but then they will not fulfill their sexual de desires upon themselves and upon their wives. And so abandoning sex in this way is considered as a slur or insult to what God had gifted the person. So many misconceptions regarding sex in Islam, a man is able to um, politically provide in terms of ideas and he can also economically provide. And this also go along with the way that the women are treated back then. For example, when a female child is buried alive for not being a boy child, a man has owed some debt and he uses his daughter or his wife to pay the amount the credit women at the time are seen as some kind of payment to an amount on as some kind of transactions i'll be illustrating my thesis and my guiding questions through five w h questions and how so sex in islam is seen heterogeneously and this is between a man and a woman who are in a legal relationship our topic is sex in islam and how this sex will happen only through marriage, reproduction, fulfillment of desire, finances. Sex in this legal marriage is seen as a way to reduce um, fornications, to reduce adulteries and all other extramarital affairs or premarital affairs. Sex is seen as an act of faith and is seen as a way in submission to what God has preordained. The witnessing of the unification is important because this is to suggest and to make people aware that these particular people are married. It is seen to happen or to occur with an individual who is of marriageable age, who is an adult, and obviously after puberty. So any person of marriageable age can enter into marriage to have sex, but a man or a woman can keep in mind that they are only able to marry a certain people and not their blood relations, excluding second cousins. Also, a man is able to marry outside of his faith. Say, if a man is a Muslim and he has a potential marriageable person who is non-Muslim, he is able to do this. But a woman of the Islamic faith, like myself, is not able to get married outside the faith. Also because of a danger of being misled or being, or being harmed, which will then be prohibited for me. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq is known to have said to his student that no one I would perceive a more pleasurable thing in this life 
before in this man's life than his sexual relation with a woman. This was to be emphasized in chapter 3 verse 14 in the Quran. The women and children have been made as worldly desires to mankind. And the prophet is known to have said that women and perfumes have been made pleasurable to him. So the prophet is also known to tell to tell his companions that when they have sexual intercourse that they are rewarded for it. If they do not have it in a legal way, they are punished. But if they had this intercourse in a legal way, then they are rewarded. And so sex in Islam is described in a way that if it's done properly, legally, it is rewarded. It is emphasis for procreation. There is also emphasis on the fact that semen, if retained, can cause bodily harms. In Islam, anal sex and menstrual sex is prohibited. There is emphasis on prayer before, before sex and doing it for the sake of Allah. And also, whatever happened between the wife and husband, they should keep it themselves. They shouldn't share it to public and... Also, there is a spiritual bath, that, like a cleansing bath, to be done after the sex. So, the article from Adam Zighe and his focus to disentangle macrocultural influences and micro-level processes that can shape individual sexual behaviors. Now, they focus on two macro-levels, which are the a nation's religion, cultural beliefs, and formal restriction on women's mobility. So at macro level, they focus to research on religion affiliations and age of forced marriages. Their research puts emphasis on cultural norms and personal religious beliefs that shapes how a person responds to their sexualities. The article also focuses on the mobility of women in, an, in a religious um, society and also the limitations on child marriages. So for their conclusions, they found that culture has significant amount of power on individual beliefs on their sexual perceptions. They also found that Muslims and Christians are less likely to report premarital affairs and Muslims especially are less likely to report extramarital affairs including Buddhists and this is to say that maybe it happens but they are less likely to report it because of their religion so that they won't be shunned and they won't be ostracized from the community and this could also mean that there are less people in both Muslims and Christians are involved or engaged in premarital sex or extramarital affairs. Another journal that offers descriptions of sex in Islam says of marriage as being the only leg legitimate way that anybody or any Muslim can have sex. Um, various texts condemn extramarital affairs and premarital sex. The Islamic text recognizes sexuality, but also it does not encourage celibacy. The Islamic text make emphasis on recognition of sexual desire, procreation, satisfaction of both participants in an heterosexual relationship. So purity and modesty is emphasized for the woman. But just as well, a man also have to be pure. So a woman who doesn't have an intact hyphen is often stigmatized and assumed as damaged. The hyphen is to find out if the woman or if the girl is a virgin. The, there are so many cultures that would be actively involved on like the first night of a couple in order to know if the woman, especially the woman, if the woman is a virgin. Sometimes, I don't know if you're familiar with white handkerchief, they, they will use this white handkerchief to wipe the vagina of the woman after an encounter with her husband on their first night and they will use this handkerchief to wipe her vagina. The white handkerchief is stained with blood that means that she is a virgin and if it's not then she's not a virgin i have also heard of so many other ways that an hyphen can break 
without any sexual contact. For example, women that engage in like vigorous exercises such as riding a horse. And it's so interesting that there are no way to find out if a man is a virgin this way. So the ideal Muslim youth is expected to transition asexually across her is or her stage of life until marriage. Muslim sexuality is seen as a threat especially to a Muslim child who is assumed as inherently sinless. The immigrant families knows that whatever it's taught in class it will directly or indirectly affect their child in terms of what they consume and eventually what they ascribe to. So there is this judgment that adolescence is immature and they are incapable of making decisions, especially on sexual relations. So there is a consensus that any kind of sexual activity that happen out of legal standards is deemed punishable under Islamic laws. Some of posts and views that I found are celibacy, abstinence, and LGBTQ. I found a quote that summarized the basis of homosexuality. So having feelings or liking the same sex is it's not considered as a sin. But acting on these urges voluntarily is considered as sinful and it is frowned upon. The solution that's mostly elaborate these urges are seen as trials, as a struggle. That individual has to go through so if they have to struggle on the cause of the creator or they will be rewarded by the creator himself new tides are however emerging and there have been female leaders lgbtq imam leaders in the muslim community they are very involved in guiding and be of guidance dalmi stated in his article he criticized the islamic norms on sexuality and he contrasted to what the Muslims, or especially in the Muslim communities or the Muslim circles, actually do. He said that the traditional norms in the in Islamic faith is that it privileges the men's sexuality over the women's sexuality, marital affairs over non-marital affairs, and heterogeneous sexual relations over homogeneous sexual relations. He made the distinction focusing on Morocco which is an Islamic community and he said that there are so many promiscuity homosexuality going on in there and this is paradoxical to what the Islamic faith actually teaches. Riani I also points another criticism by Yib and Yib said that there is strong support for sexual essentialism and it doesn't accommodate individual agencies and diversity of experiences. So her notion, Raza's notion, says that the feminists and the imams leaders should gather and reinterpret the religious text so jointly so that they can have like one consensus on what the meanings are and not difference of meanings or um, ambiguity in meanings. There are many discussions now on Muslim youth and their sexuality, how they interpret it for themselves or for others. For example, a Muslim youth immigrant have their own ideals and the ideals taught in their homes, but then when they are in the whole society, there is another ideal that is being populated. There is always discourse in these two forms of ideals that a Muslim or a youth or any adolescent have to fight. And also there are so many discussions on LGBTQ. A little was found on CSPD and Islam, and the consensus is that any kind of sexual porn, masturbation, anything like that outside of illegal marriage is prohibited and so it is seen. So the person suffering from CSPD must seek professional help as well as pray to God for guidance, for forgiveness, and for better health. There is explanations of sex in other arenas, such as interracial relationships, 
um, the use of sex tools. There's a desire not to be misinformed and to be misinformed. Moms or leaders and scholars alike, would they shy away from shunning people away or saying something that might be against or that might go against what an individual desire actually is. So many Muslim societies are not open to the discussion on LGBT communities or the LGBT ideals and for this reason research are limited in this area of topics and also representations are also low and often the researches that are made are only like basically in the western society where even though the community is diverse but it's still very skilled to be generalized to the public. Conflict of interest happens with the struggles in preordained rules from the creator and the and guiding the mass and this has to do with imams, leaders and scholars. Most often they don't want to say what goes against the text by misguiding or misinforming their followers. Single women really they can they are not able to communicate or they miscommunicate or there is no communications at all regarding their sexual desires. Communities frown on sexual talks in terms of even like therapy or whatnot, deeming it as a talk between a husband and a wife and that's it. A lot of Muslim youth found it conflicting to integrate the, their culture with the Western ideal. From this project, I learned that there are counselings and therapies available for people and for Muslim youths to seek in order to get guidance. There is emphasis on cultural influences and at a micro level, it does impact how an individual reacts sexually. Opposing views exist and will continue to to exist despite Islamic notions or Islamic imams or leaders that shy away from discussing about these opposing views. Also a problem in viewing childhood or adolescence sexuality as a threat. So recently I've been involved and listening to discussions on sexual urges that have been deemed sinful and that many leaders, many Muslim or religious leaders have shied away from talking and now they are openly discussing and giving a support in one way or the other. And fight for the cause of faith and for Allah, the Creator, to not act on the urges that have been deemed sinful. I was baffled by how the woman bodies has always been deemed as pleasurable, especially with one of my sl slides when the prophet was, was known to have said that women and perfumes had been made pleasurable to him. Or the imam that told the students that nothing is more pleasurable in this world and in the next than having a sexual relation with a woman. I was baffled by this comment, but I think the emphasis is made on the woman to show or to signify the preordained sexual relation that has been established for human lifestyles. From my researches, I found that so many donors talk about sex being healthy and, and within the LV regulation is also the law guiding on who can have sex and why to have sex. For my last personal comment or personal opinion is actually a question. Do I feel limited as a Muslim woman on what I can or cannot do? regarding intimate relation. For the time being, I am unmarried and single. Sometimes I do feel that there are certain limitations and there are certain things that pull me away from acting forward or experiences or romantic, I don't know, um, fantasies. Sometimes it can feel limiting in the sense that at this present moment, I am not able to have sex unless I am married to someone. So it can feel limiting because in the society that I live in, it seems like having a marital or romantic intimate relationship is a progress in life. But when an individual finds themselves in a particular stage in life and for a long period of time, it will feel as if one is a failure. 
when it shouldn't be so. So my last slide is on references. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and following through.